Welcome to the Hope Natural Health Podcast. I'm Dr. Erin Ellis, your host. On this show, we discuss all things health, hormones, and happiness with a little side of this thing called life. Dr. Glenn Livingston was a longtime CEO of a multi-million dollar consulting firm, which has serviced several Fortune 500 clients in the food industry. Disillusioned by what traditional psychology had to offer overweight and or food obsessed individuals, Dr. Livingston spent several decades researching the nature of binging and overeating via work with his own clients and a self-funded research program with more than 40,000 participants. He earned his his PhD in psychology from Yeshiva University in 1991. I'm super excited for him to be here, and we're going to be speaking all about the science of cravings, because who doesn't have cravings? And we're going to learn more about it and why we have it. So welcome to the show, Dr. Glenn. Thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this, Erin. It's nice to be here. Yay. And where is Yeshiva University? Oh, that was... um at the Einstein Medical Campus in the Bronx in New York. Oh, um, cool. New York City. New York Neat. City, where, where I grew up, thereabouts, yeah. Uh, this is totally off topic, and I'm assuming, is that your, your real dining room table in the background with all of that fruit? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it is. And what That's are you, are, are you physically going to eat all that? That's a lot of bananas. Well, I, I, I'm going to freeze most of it um, oh, okay. shortly, shortly, but, but I, I'm a... Um, I, I largely eat fruit and vegetables. That, that's the bulk of my diet these days. I, you know, I have some. A fruititarian. N- not quite. I, I have plenty of leafy green vegetables, but I. Okay. Yeah. When, when I go to the supermarket, they ask me if I live with a gorilla. <laughs> or they ask me, what, what, what am I planning to do with all those bananas? And I said, I was thinking about putting them in my mouth, but I'm not going to eat them all at once. I promise. Oh my gosh. I love it. If you are just listening on the podcast, if we also air this on YouTube and you can see the video and you'll know what I'm talking about, but there's, oh gosh, she's got one, two, three, four, five, at least six watermelons that I can count. And like, literally it does look like he's uh, has a, a pet monkey, which would be cool. I wouldn't be opposed to that. You could, you could just say as yes for my monkey, but that's awesome. Just I just noticed that sometimes asked. people have backgrounds and I'm like, what is that for reals? All that fruit back there? Anyways, we'll my, dive my, into my, the show. My, just so that nobody asks, my A1C is 4.8. It's actually down from before I used to eat like this. Um, oh, that's I, amazing. I have, a lot, I have a lot of, you know, fiber from vegetables and it's only whole fruit. I don't do fruit juice or things like that, so. I love it. I love it. Well, welcome to the show. First, before we dive into cravings, tell me a little bit more about how you went from a consulting firm to doing what you're doing now and and really focusing on binge eating and overworking or overeating. Well, you know, I I was um, not just a doctor who wanted to work with overweight individuals. I, I had a really serious eating problem myself. I was almost 300 pounds, and I, mm. I like to say I lost a war with a chocolate bar in 1982, and I didn't wake up for 20 years. Oh, wow. um, so it, it was a personal problem, and I came from a family of 17 psychologists, mm. and when something broke in the house, people knew how to ask it how it feels, but we didn't know how to fix it. And um, so I, I thought there must be a hole in my heart, and I, I went the psychological route. I thought... If I could fill that metaphorical hole in my heart, then I wouldn't keep trying to fill the hole in my stomach. Mm-hmm. And I went to the best doctors and therapists, and I went on a spiritual journey, and I cried and screamed and confessed my soul and did all the things a nice Jewish boy from New York needs to do to try and cleanse themselves. And it, it was a very helpful journey from the standpoint of developing self-compassion, but it didn't really help me with the food. I, mm. I got like a little fatter, a little thinner and a lot fatter, a little thinner and a lot fatter. Um, I married a marketer who traveled for business. And so in my youth, I had an awful lot of time on my hands. She was gone all week long. And I decided to start a second career consulting for industry. So I, I was in advertising research. I was working mostly for big food and big pharma. I feel like I was on the wrong side of the war, trying to Mm -hmm. make up for it now. But, um, and eventually, you know, over the years that I was doing that consulting and struggling with my own food, I saw that they were engineering these hyper palatable concentrations of starch and sugar and fat and salt and excitotoxins. And it was, 
it was all geared to hit the bliss point in the reptilian brain without really mm -hmm. giving us enough nutrition to feel satisfied. And the result of that is you can't stop. Like you're, you're, you think you're looking for love in the bottom of a bag or a box or container, but really the, the, the reptilian brain doesn't really know love. It, it's more like eat, mate, or kill, like a bad college drinking game. <laughs> it's this primitive part of our brain that can push aside the rational part of our brain when it perceives there to be a very scarce caloric opportunity or some type of an emergency that becomes important a little later. Um, and so eventually, I, well, first I designed my own study and over the course of five years when internet clicks were cheap, I got um, about 40,000 people to take a survey and I would intercept them when they were feeling stressed, searching for stress management solutions. And I'd say, what are you stressed about? And what is it that you can't stop eating when you feel stressed? Mm -hmm. And I found three really interesting things and I thought this was gonna be my answer. Um, people who struggle with chocolate like I did, they tended to be lonely, broken, harder, or depressed. People who struggled with crunchy, salty things like, um, you know, chips and pretzels, they tended to be stressed at work. And people who struggled with soft, chewy, starchy things like bread and bagels and pasta, they tended to be stressed at home. And I thought, mm -hmm. okay, well, that's at least some direction. I can probably figure this out. And I was a chocolate person. I was, um, at least that was always the beginning of my bench, you know, mm -hmm. or just one little bite of chocolate. That's all it was going to be. And then it, mm -hmm. then it was 10 more and then it was 10 more bars and pizza and everything yeah. that I could shovel from there. So I called my mom who was also a therapist. And I said, you know what, mom, before I talk about this or you know, try harder to solve my own problem, I just want to understand what could have happened. And I know you struggle with chocolate also. You raised me, you're a therapist. I, I was in a kind of upsetting marriage, so it made sense that I was feeling the way that I did, but why in the world And she got this really horrible look on her face and she went, oh honey, I'm so sorry. Mm. And I said, mom, mom, it's okay. It, you know, this was decades ago. I love you, I forgive you. I'm just trying to figure this out. And she said, honey, well, when you were one year old in 1965, your father was a captain in the army and they were talking about sending him to Vietnam and we were trying to get pregnant with your sister and I was really terrified that I was going to be an army widow. Mm -hmm. At the same time, your grandfather, my dad, he just got out of prison and we had no idea where he'd been mm -hmm. and I loved and idolized him and I felt like my whole world was falling apart. I didn't know that he was guilty. I didn't know what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And so half the time I was sitting, sitting and staring at the wall, feeling depressed and anxious when you would come running to me for love or needing some comfort or something like that. So I put a big bottle of chocolate Bosco syrup in a refrigerator on the floor. And when you'd come running to me, I'd say, honey, go get your Bosco. And you'd go crawling over to the for the refrigerator and you take out the chocolate Bosco syrup and you'd suck on the bottle and you go into a chocolate sugar coma. Um, and you know, that's probably why, that's probably how I taught you to go to chocolate when you felt lonely or anxious or depressed. Mm. And so Aaron, I, I thought that should be our movie moment, you know, like if, mm -hmm. the, if this were the movies, then at that point we should have a big hug and a big cry. And then I'd never have trouble with food again. Um, but it was actually the opposite because I'm going a little fast because no, we don't have a lot of time. No, it's but, good. So it's like there was this crazy voice inside of me. I'm not schizophrenic, but it was this voice of justification mm -hmm. which said, you know what, Glenn, you're right. Our mama didn't love us enough. Mm -hmm. And until you can get, you, you, can, you can either fix this marriage or get out and find the love of your life, you're going to have to go right on eating chocolate. Yippee, let's go get some right now. Mm -hmm. that, that was really the paradigm shifter for me. That's when I said, maybe this is not about loving yourself thin. Maybe it's about, um, maybe it's about taking control of that biological drive. And there are other biological drives you take control over. Like, uh, for example, if I really had to pee right now, I would say, I'm sorry, but I'm talking to Aaron and I've got an important interview and, you know, I'll take care of you. I'm not going to ignore you completely, but mm -hmm. I'm in charge, not my bladder. Or if, if there's a really attractive woman on the street, I don't run up into her and kiss her. Right? I might actually run the other way because I'm kind of shy, but, but <laughs> you're, you're expected to control these things. You're expected right. to, and so why does this have to be any different? And I did kind of a crazy thing back then. I said, 
well, if I'm going to control this thing, and I actually got this, I was reading some alternative addiction um, treatment literature, and they, they were recommending kind of um, bifurcating your thoughts, making a clear line between your constructive and destructive thoughts when it came to the pleasurable substance. This was more in drugs and alcohol, which I didn't have a problem with. But I said, well, I could do that in food. So what, what if I call this thing my food monster, right? And, and I'll make a rule so that I know when it's awake. I'll set up like a tripwire so I will never have chocolate on a weekday again. I know people have all kinds of objections to that. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that, but that's what I did. And then if I was in a Starbucks and I'd worked out hard and there's a chocolate bar in the counter when I'm going to get my coffee, um, I would say to, to myself, and it was saying, you know, it'll be just as easy to start your silly rule again tomorrow. And you're not going to get any win anyway because you worked out hard at just a little bit. Mm -hmm. I would say, wait a minute, that's not me. That's my inner food monster. And it's moaning for monster mush. Chocolate on a Wednesday is monster mush. I don't eat monster mush. I don't let fictional animals tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. um, I actually called it something different. I don't like to use that word anymore. So I changed it to monster. Because <laughs> it, it was going to be a private thing. I wasn't going to be teaching yeah. millions of people. Um, it wasn't a miracle. But I was suddenly not confused about it anymore. It's, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've been to places where they told me it was a chronic, progressive, mysterious disease and that I could never hope to control it. The best I could do was abstain one day at a time and that I had to come to meetings and talk to sponsors. And, um, and I, I couldn't quite accept that. I felt like, I no, I have power over this thing. I know I do. So that kind of went away. I stopped feeling powerless, and I'd get those extra microseconds at the moment of impulse. It's like it was opening up a space between stimulus and response. And um, slowly but surely, I found things to do in that space. Mm -hmm. Mostly what I found was a way to disempower the logic that my food monster was using. For example, it's not just as easy to start tomorrow because the way the brain works, mm -hmm. if you have a craving today and you reinforce and you have a thought, I'll start tomorrow, mm -hmm. and you reinforce that craving by having the chocolate today, then tomorrow you're going to have a deeper craving and you're going to be more likely to have a thought because you will have reinforced them both. So you can only ever use the present moment to be healthy. And if you're in a hole, you better stop digging. Mm -hmm. So I kept the journal for... A lot of years. It took me. It took me. It took me a couple of years to really get thin, but a, a lot of years to really master it. It doesn't take that long anymore because we know a lot more things. Um, and when I was getting divorced, I needed something to do. My businesses were all tied up with my ex-wife, and I was a minor partner in a publishing company from all the experience I had in business. And I said to the CEO. Like, I need to do something. I think I want to write a book. He says, that's perfect because we need to publish our own book and prove that we know what we're doing so we could attract better authors. So I turn it all into a book over the summer. I send it to him. And two weeks later, he calls back and he says, donuts, donuts are monster mush. I don't eat donuts. I don't let monsters tell me what to do. He proceeds to lose about 90 pounds over the next 18 months. Along the way, we publish the book and... I, I put everything into it. I decided I don't care about money anymore. I just want to do something meaningful. Um, and, you know, I'd been in marketing a good part of my life, and so had he. And we both kind of knew what we were doing, but we had no idea how much it was going to take off. And um, we wound up with over 20,000 reviews and eight books. And, um, you know, and then I got a gig on Psychology Today, and I got another million readers there. And it developed into this agency, this coaching agency, where we worked with almost 2,000 paying clients to help them to stop overeating, all because they had this thing inside of them that they wanted to control. Yeah. There's more to how, I mean, we started tracking results and we had to revise things to make it better. Um, but we got essentially really good at helping people fix their thinking in the first five or six years. So they no longer had any excuses to overeat. Mm -hmm. And then there was still this screw it, just do it response, mm -hmm. which seems to be derived from um, like a, what, what I would call organismic distress, some type of falsely perceived emergency, not eating regularly enough, not getting enough sleep, not, not feeling connected enough to other people or a tribe, not getting enough water. Uh, a lot of the things you might talk about with regards to self-regulation. Um, and that's, that really dampens down 
the screw it, just do it response. So that's what I do. Um, and now I'm known as the, as the guy with a little monster inside of him. Um, and uh, I actually love it. I, I love what I do. I love helping yeah. people with this. And um, that's I love it. So when was the last time you had chocolate? I got to ask. A long, long yeah. time ago. A long, long, yeah, like years and years and years. I, what I found is, and this was kind of the goal, but I didn't realize it would happen, is that if you follow a rule for long enough and you have to have a why, you can't just follow it as if there's a Nazi food policeman in your head, you know, saying, mm -hmm. you will not have chocolate, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to have a reason to do it. Like, um, you know, for me, it was to be a, tall, fit leader who could walk on the world with a smiling presence and not worry mm -hmm. about diabetes and cardiovascular. Um, when you do that, after some time, your identity function clicks in. Mm -hmm. It says, well, you must be a person who doesn't eat chocolate. Mm. And eventually, I don't even know when I got rid of the rule. Like, I don't have a rule that says I don't eat chocolate. I just, I just don't. I'm just mm -hmm. a person who doesn't eat chocolate. So, nice. um, yeah, so it's a long, long time. Very long. Yeah, time. I just had to ask. So, how can someone listening or, or anyone really identify their own triggers for binge eating, and what strategies can they use to to help manage them? Okay, that's a fifty cent question. <laughs> um, I usually tell people to start with one simple rule. So most people know. Um, most people know what their worst overeating behaviors are. The problem is that what most people do is they live on this feast and famine roller coaster. Mm -hmm. There's this old old Henry fellow Lonsworth, I forget the name of the poet. He wrote a poem, said, he said that when she was good, she was very, very good, but when she was bad, she was horrid. There was a little girl. Mm -hmm. And that's how most people eat. Like they're following the latest diet or they're trying to be really, really, really good and get back down. Mm -hmm. And then they can't take it anymore and they just, they go crazy. Yeah. Yep. And the problem in that is you're telling your brain that you live in a feast and famine environment. And in the environment in which we evolved, um, there probably was a scarcity of food. And so that when food was suddenly available, if there was a harvest or a hunt, you probably had to eat all you could. And so you're reliving that with this feast and famine roller coaster, dieting and then binging, diet and then. Mm -hmm. So you want to try to regulate your food to be, um, you know, more reliably nutritious. Um, I tell people, like, even though I know there are a lot of medical benefits for intermittent fasting, I tell them not to do it for about four months while they're learning to stop binging because it seems to trigger this thing mm -hmm. and, until you get fat adapted. It seems to trigger that. Um, so I ask people to start with one simple rule, something that they could and would do that is not too much of a burden. Mm -hmm. For example, there's a truck driver who said, you know, I have to eat fast food three times a day, but I'll mm -hmm. tell you what, I won't go back for seconds. I'm not going to stop eating fast food because I have to stop at these truck stops, but mm -hmm. I won't go back for seconds. What happens when you do that? It's something he could and would do. And it didn't really matter how motivated he was because he could always have what he wanted to, but he just didn't mm -hmm. go back for seconds because motivation comes and goes. So it's a low bar that he could jump over regardless of his motivation. Then he starts to feel like a winner. Like, okay, I lost a little bit of weight. Maybe I still have a hundred pounds to go, but I'm going in the right direction. And you know, Doug Graham said direction is more important than speed. And I think people kind of know that when they're mm -hmm. headed in the right direction, they're not panicked. When they're headed in the wrong direction, they're, they're kind of panicked. Um, and so your identity function takes over and it becomes easier and just you become a person who doesn't go back for seconds. And then once you see that you can take control of this thing, you're not mm -hmm. someone who has to, um, you know, has to live at the mercy of this inner food monster forever. Then you start to adjust the rules. I forgot an important part. Um, once you make a rule, there's going to be a part of you that wants to break it. Mm -hmm. It's just how it is. Right? And mm -hmm. we want that. We want that to happen. Yep. What you want to do is start listening for what that part is saying. So I'll never go back for seconds again. You're going to be at a truck stop or even if you made this in a regular person's daily life, you're going to feel like the meal wasn't quite enough and your inner food monster is going to say, you know, a little extra broccoli wouldn't hurt or just another half a plate wouldn't be a big deal. Um, 
you know, one more bite's not going to kill you, right? Mm -hmm. And what you want to do at that point is wake up and you want to take a deep breath. Um, our, our nervous system is set up kind of intriguingly, essentially with two parts. You, you could take me to town on this, I'm sure. But they, they, they call it the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Essentially, the sympathetic nervous system is what gets us ready to run away from hungry tigers. Um, it, it, it says, breathe fast, run, you know, run for your life, there's an emergency, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. The parasympathetic nervous system says, it's okay to rest and digest and think rationally and strategically. Mm -hmm. And you can trigger that in some ways by breathing out for longer than you breathe in. So mm -hmm. Lori Hammond likes to call them 7-11 breaths. You breathe in for a count of seven and breathe out for a count of 11. You will start to tell your brain, everything's okay. There's no mm -hmm. emergency here. That's important because you need to get into your rational brain. You need to feel like it's not time to act, it's time to think. Mm -hmm. Once you've taken a couple of breaths like that, then you say, well, why does my food master monster want me to break this rule? I made this rule when I was of sound mind and body and mm -hmm. I had the fortitude and presence to think about something that would be really good for me. Why should I break it and give up on those hopes and dreams? And then you write down what it says and you write down everything it says. Carry a little pencil and paper around or use your smartphone. Um, and so it, it, might, it might say, oh, come on, you're, it's genetic, your parents are obese and you're doomed. In which case you would say, well, the research shows that while genetics pay a, play a significant part, part in obesity, diet and lifestyle factor is actually a little more important. And so, and even if it's a harder mountain for me to climb, does that mean I should just lay down a roll all the way down the mountain, get as fat as I can? I don't think so, mm -hmm. right? Or if it says one bite won't make a difference, you'll say, well, one bite is the difference between who's in charge, you or me, Mr. Food Monster, and I don't want to be your slave, I want to be your master. I want to be the master of my own. So you ask yourself, what's wrong? with your food monster's logic. Then you take another 7-11 breath. That's usually enough for people to consider making another decision. Mm -hmm. But what you can also do is say, well, why would I feel like a happier, better person if I followed my original rule? Mm -hmm. Well, I would feel like a happier, better person because I'd feel in control because I, um, I could be present and smile because I won't have to be sitting bloated and sweating on the couch because I know it's not going to be just another bite. I know it's going to be a or the couple of servings, I'm going to be giving mm -hmm. up on my goals. And you, you write all that down and you kind of link the, you link the desire to um, something very concrete that you can achieve. And it's either something you can achieve in the long run. Um, you know, like sometimes people will talk about weight loss and I'm not going to lose 50 pounds tomorrow. Um, so maybe that's a year from now. Or you can ask yourself, how will things be better today, tomorrow, or in 10 days if I just stick with this rule? And there are usually some very significant things, often having to do with digestion or energy or not being so irritable with your spouse or being able to play with the kids or the dog. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the simplest version of what you can do on a very practical basis to start to get control. Um, and then if we have time, that there's a lot to understand in terms of how the science of cravings formation and extinction works that would help people to not. Yeah. Make if you want to dive a, a little bit into that, that would be great. How much time do I have? Uh, I would say 10 ish minutes. Okay. Interrupt me when you have to. I'll, I'll, I'll try okay. to go fast. Less than 10. Okay. So the first thing to know is that having strong food cravings does not mean that you're broken. Some people, they walk around saying, what's wrong with me? Why can't I stop eating? I want you to stop saying that. Mm -hmm. First of all, because when you say, why can't I stop eating? You're directing your brain to find reasons that you can't stop eating. The questions mm -hmm. we ask determine the evidence that we collect. Mm -hmm. So when you say that, you're going to find evidence that you can't stop eating and you're going to develop a failure identity. So mm -hmm. the first thing you want to do is stop asking that. Ask, how can I stop eating instead? And then you'll mm -hmm. find ways that you, you can eat better. Um, we had to have strong cravings in order to survive. As a matter of fact, the ancestors who had stronger cravings would have been more motivated to find the cues that led to food and calorie acquisition. Mm -hmm. uh, so they would be more likely to survive. 
So having very strong cravings does not mean that you have a sick brain. It means you have a healthy brain in a sick food environment. Mm -hmm. um, Ricardo Krishnamurti said, it's no measure of wellness to be well adjusted to a profoundly disturbed environment. Right, mm -hmm. finally disturbed society. That's kind of the situation we have here. The modern food environment is taking advantage of the people that have stronger cravings. But it doesn't mean that mm -hmm. you're sick. It means you have it's a stronger muscle. It's a muscle. Okay. Then you need to understand that cravings are usually attached to food cues. Sometimes they're internal, but usually they're external. So I pass the donut store sign on the way home from work and I'm stopping and getting donuts every day, developing a little punch. Or I'm at the beach and the fresh you know, sea air with the negative ions and the salty smell and the warmth on my face reminds me that I want ice cream because there's usually an ice cream store available at the beach when that's the case. Um, it could be going out to dinner, you know, the smells at the restaurant or the way that the waiter presents the tiramisu at the end of the dessert tray. These are signals that in primitive times, our brain's ability to latch onto signals would help us to find food. Mm -hmm. Like for example, maybe there was a caveman, let's call him Thag, T-H-A-G, just because I like the name. Maybe there was a caveman who would find banana trees by following monkeys. One day he saw a monkey that led him to a banana tree and he said, wow, this is really cool. Monkeys equals bananas. So Thag's brain, it doubles down on the dopamine when it sees a monkey and says, go get it, this is going to be great. And Thag gets all excited and happy on the way to finding the mm -hmm. bananas as he's chasing the monkey, just like you might get excited and happy as you decided to drive to the store to get your junk, not when you're actually eating it, but when you're on the way. Mm -hmm. um, if Thag sees a monkey and doesn't get up and start following it, Thag's brain drops his dopamine to punish him. He says, I'm going to make you miserable until you until you go follow that monkey. Mm -hmm. So that, that's where cravings come from. Um, people correspondingly think that if you stop rewarding the craving, that it's going to go here. I need to do it backwards because we're, it's going to go from very, very high to low in a straight line. Mm -hmm. Like the first day is going to be the hardest, mm -hmm. second day will be a little easier, and so on and so on and so on. And as a result of that misperception, they make some serious mistakes. Because here's what actually happens. The cravings go from um, up high with a little bit of relief as you start. It's like a little honeymoon period. And then all of a sudden, you're going to have worse cravings than you ever had. It's just going to mm -hmm. jump up. I don't know where the camera's not showing what I want it to show. It's okay. And then after that, it's in the literature, it's called the cravings extinction burst, um, or an extinction burst. After the extinction burst, then it's going to start coming down. And there'll be mm -hmm. a couple of little bursts at the end before your brain eventually labels it dormant. It will never forget how it learned to acquire calories. It thinks that binging on bananas is keeping you alive, so it's never going to forget. But it will label it dormant so that you don't waste energy and you're not bothered by it. Okay. First of all, why is there this extinction burst? It, it seems very random and like, why would our brains do this? There's an extinction burst because when Thag follows monkeys to trees, in reality, it probably only, they probably won't always 100% of the time lead to bananas. Um, either the season would wear on and maybe he'll follow a tree, a monkey to a, a barren tree. Um, or maybe there are competitive monkeys in the area that are also eating the bananas with competitive cavemen. And so after a while, Thag will probably follow a monkey to a tree and have no reward. It doesn't make sense for Thag's brain to give up at that point because what's happened is the bananas have become intermittently available at random. And in primitive times, it was better to have a monkey that led to a banana tree 50% of the time than no monkey at all because where is Thag going to find food? As a matter of fact, it was probably better to have a monkey that led to a banana tree 20% of the time. This type of reinforcement schedule um, is the most powerful reinforcement schedule that we see in the literature. This is why uh, you see all those old ladies getting stuck at slot machines in Las Vegas, because <laughs> they got to be there. 
Like it's the most mm-hmm. powerful motivation. You just pull the, pull this. You got to pull the lever. You got because sooner or later it's going to pay off, right? Mm-hmm. That's what Thag's brain is thinking. Sooner or later it's going to pay off. Um, however, it's also a survival advantage not to waste energy, which is why you you won't be tortured forever. So you're going to get this extinction burst. You have to be prepared for it. But what most people do when they get there is they think, oh my God. This is torture. I can't do this. This is going to last forever. And at that point, they reinforce the craving. They give in and they reinforce it, telling the brain that it's available mm-hmm. at random, which is the exact wrong thing to do. What you want to do is power through. You want to take care of yourself in other ways so you can get through this. So if I decide I'm not going to stop at the donut store, I need to know so I don't go into the battlefield wearing a plastic helmet. So it's going to be a rough month, especially in the beginning. I'm going to have some really serious extinction bursts. And so I want to try to get a little extra sleep or drink a little more water or make sure that I'm connected to my tribe or, you know, um, you know, very regularly neutrify me in myself in other ways. Maybe I don't try to lose weight that month. Maybe I, I'm just, just eating uh, at maintenance, but I'm eating a lot of healthy food so that my body doesn't feel like there's an emergency that it needs nutrition. And it makes the extinction burst easier to get through. That way, I'm going to push through. You don't have to do anything about it. You just got to push through. The only way out is through. The other serious mistake people make at the end of the extinction curve, there are a couple of little last tries, but they'll, they'll think to themselves, oh my God, I got this. This is no longer, this is no longer torturous. The mm-hmm. cravings are gone. Of course, I can have donuts whenever I want to have donuts now. Mm-hmm. And they reinforce it at random. The ring goes, oh boy, mm-hmm. oh boy, oh boy. It's available at random. I better go through the extinction burst again. So don't do that. If you want to continue eating something, let's say I wanted to continue having donuts, but I want to get it under control. Mm -hmm. And two out of three people can do this. Sometimes the neurological groove is too deep and you really do have to give it up. But two out of three people are able to bind the reward to a very specific context. Mm -hmm. So for example, maybe I'll say, I'm only ever going to have donuts on Saturdays after my workout and no more than two. So your, your brain is capable of learning that the same way that it would be capable of learning that a slot machine was programmed to only pay off at 10 o'clock on Saturday mornings. If you programmed a slot, the slot machines in Las Vegas to only pay off at 10 o'clock on Saturday mornings, within a month, there wouldn't be people lined up and pulling the machines all week long. The casinos mm-hmm. would empty out, or at least that area would empty out, right? Mm-hmm. Your brain will do that also. You can make very specific rules. I, I only eat um, pretzels in a major league baseball park, or um, I generally don't eat bread except at a restaurant when I can have two slices per calendar week. Like very specific set of stimuli and cues. Okay. Then there's one more big mistake people make and then I'll shut up and we can we can wrap up or you can ask me any questions you want to. Um, because cravings come in cue craving pairs, food stimulus craving pairs, people often extinguish one stimulus without paying attention to the other stimuli that are cueing the the craving. So for example, I could go through 30 days in my regular day-to-day life and not stop at the donut store, and I'm not bothered by donut cravings at all. And I make the mistake of thinking that I've completely extinguished donut cravings, but I haven't. I've extinguished the donut store sign on the way home from work. Then I go to my mom's house, and my mom serves donuts and, you know, plays Mm -hmm. poker with her girlfriends. And I go, I go there one Saturday, I hadn't been there for a couple of months, and I've got worse cravings than I've had in years. The reason for that is that I didn't extinguish my mom's house. So I didn't fail, I succeeded with the donut store sign, I failed to identify mm-hmm. the other cues. So as a practical matter, you want to make a list of where at least 80% of your cravings occur, so you're not shocked by that, mm. and then make a plan to get through it. Okay, that's that's. Oh my the, gosh, that's so, the brain is, I mean, it's insane like how much it controls pretty much everything Mm -hmm. that we do and it's a lot of it is it you know you didn't touch on subconscious but a lot of it is the subconscious brain Mm -hmm. so really most of this is beyond your most most of this is beyond your awareness yeah yeah which is even more fascinating but i think it starts and we we do a lot of conversations like this it starts primarily with awareness and asking yourself like you said like why do i need this or why do why do why am I sabotaging myself or going against you know my rules that I said? So I think that's super important. That was really interesting. Gosh, we could speak for a long time more about this. I'm sure you have so much more to offer, but you do have 
a free cop or you you're offering a free copy of your book that's available in Kindle, Nook, and PDF PDF format. So we'll make sure that we have that link in the show notes for anyone to download Just that. Yeah, at your website. Um, so we'll make sure to include that. But we'll, I'll wrap up here. Um, I wish we had more time, but I'll wrap up with one question that I ask all of my podcast guests. What would be your best or favorite health tip that you can share with the audience? Um, oh, I start every day with a, a green smoothie. Usually has some berries in it. and um, A banana. Swiss, I often have <laughs> bananas in the morning. I, I, I don't have as many calories in the morning. But yes, I. for those listeners who have any doubt, I do eat some bananas. <laughs> um, but I, I usually do that after exercise to recover more, more yeah. so than before. Yeah. So starting with a green smoothie and, and what's your reasoning behind that? Or why, I, why is that your best tip to start off with something you like know, that? As I was giving up chocolate, mm -hmm. I found that it wasn't enough to just say, I will never have chocolate again. Cause I eventually mm -hmm. evolved and never have it. I had to substitute with some type of real nutrition and I experimented mm -hmm. with a lot of things and what really did it for me was um, a kale, celery, and banana smoothie. I experimented with a lot of different hmm. types of smoothies. And I found that, you know, it doesn't it doesn't get you high the same way that a chocolate bar will get you high, <laughs> all the feel remain in sugar and fat mm -hmm. and you know, et cetera, toxins. Um, and by the way, if you want to have chocolate, then have chocolate. I, I don't <laughs> preach abstinence for everyone. Right. Um, but for me, I needed to. Um, but it, it would make me feel content. It's like it scratched mm -hmm. the itch. I wouldn't be bothered. I said, oh, all right, I'll go back to work. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I started experimenting with starting my days like that. Mm. And I just I just kind of reduced the calories in the morning because I, I wanted to burn the fat in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I love that. Kale banana, kale banana celery smoothie was my favorite. I would usually juice the celery. Okay. All right. I might have to try that one. Sounds delicious. Well, Dr. Glenn, thank you so much for being on the show. It was a great conversation. I hope my audience learned something about the science behind cravings and they're real and we can work through them. So I appreciate your education and knowledge on this topic. Thank you. You get it for free at defeatyourcravings.com. Awesome. Thank you. And we will see everyone again next week. <music>